Yes, okay, so good morning to all. I am uh, Joseph Caldu from the Nutri Genomics and Fish Growth Endocrinology Group from Institute of Aquaculture Torre de la Sal in, as a center of the sea in the Mediterranean coast of Spain. This group is led uh, by Professor Jaume Perez. He regrets to, to not be here, but he has a quite busy uh, agenda lately. After the, present, the last presentation of David with the recommended dietary levels of vitamins for Gilgit Sibrim, I will show you now how the use of target transcriptomics in the intestine can serve for the determination of the requirements in vitamins and other nutrients in Gilgit Sibrim and other uh, fish species of interest. As it has been explained before uh, by, by David, uh, animals cannot produce de novo most of these nutrients, so they have to be necessarily included in the diets. And at the same time, vitamins used to be the most expensive ingredients in these fish, for, fish feed formulations. This is a quite important reason for not exceeding the amount required for animal nutrition. And there are also, of course, the issues related to the vitamin deficiency and also toxicity caused by an excess in some vitamins. To further uh, complicate this, the requirements of the different vitamins can vary depending on the fish species. In addition, the determination of the vitamin requirements has been studied taking into account different parameters depending on the vitamin to be studied. The growth rates are of course important and classical observation in this kind of studies include skeletal anomalies and deformities, the enzymatic antioxidant capacity in blood or liver, also the blood coagulation and how the blood and lipid and how the blood and the cell immune parameters are affected or among others, the effects of, on the lipid metabolism. Many parameters by different techniques in different tissues, depending on the nutrient to be studied. So the approach that we have used in the present analysis has been, okay, vitamins are provided by diet and they are absorbed by the digestive system of the fish, by the intestine. So we are going to analyze the response of these grad levels of vitamins directly in the intestine of Gilgit Sibrim, making use of a unique, a single technique directed to the mind intestine functions. And we will see how the different levels of vitamins affect to these functions and also how it can help us to determine the nutritional requirements of Gilgit Sibrim, or at least to be able to see if there is a deficiency or an excess of these tested nutrients. The tool we are going to use, target transcriptomics, is one of the molecular tools that our research group has included in the offer of our uh, biotechnological platform for the assessment of fish nutrition, health and welfare. These molecular tools are used in many experimental protocols in the framework of different projects and contracts and are based in the fact that we have sequenced and have access to the transcriptome and genome of the Gilgit Sibrim. So we use this knowledge as the starting point for the design of homologous microarrays or as the basis for a transcriptome model for RNA-seq. These massive techniques are what we call untargeted transcriptomics, as we look for the simultaneous expression of thousands of genes, we are not looking for any specific target. By contrast, the use of PCR arrays, the same and focus in some biological pathways and genes of interest would be the target transcriptomics. And the transcriptome can also be used to construct a reference proteome that would be of utility in proteome studies based in gel electrophoresis or eye track. In the present study, with animals that were fed diets with deficiency excess of control amounts 
of the mix of uh, vitamins B, B1, B9, B12, or with lipid soluble vitamins D or K3 in the trials that David has explained, we took samples of the anterior intestine of this fish for extraction of RNA, and then we ran a specific focus PCR array, target transcriptomics. This gene expression profiling is made in our infrastructure in 96 well plates in a semi-automatic way with pipetting and handling made with a robot that ensures the accuracy and repeatability when analyzing a high number of genes simultaneously. This PCR array, the GAT chip, has been designed to analyze in the intestine the levels of gene expression of 44, 44 selected markers that include 11 markers of the integrity of epithelium, four markers of nutrient transport, three mucins, and many markers of the inflammatory response that include nine interleukins, seven cell markers, two immunoglobulins, and eight markers of pathogen-associated microbial pattern. This approach also allows to have the relative expression of each gene, not only in comparison with the same gene in other diets, but also of the other genes, of the rest of genes in the same of different diets. So we can start to see the results of this PCR array, the GAT chip, on the fish that were fed gradual levels of the mix of vitamin B. You can see here the levels of vitamin B1, B9, B12 for each of the three diets, corresponding to the experiences pre previously told by David. And here, the expression of the differentially expressed genes. For the rest of markers, there were no statistical differences in the level of expression comparing the diets. But for these 14, there were differences and we are going to see them in more detail and see how it can guide us to verify or determine the nutrient requirements of fish. First, we see which are the differentially expressed markers and we see that there are two genes related to epithelium integrity. One, fatty acid binding protein one, related to nutrient transport. Also one mucin, mucin two. Four interleukins, three cell markers, and one three related to pathogen associated microbial pattern. Now we are going to see in detail what was the gene response to the different diets? In general, the low levels of the mix of vitamin B were associated with an upregulation, with an increase of the expression here marked in red, in the case of the fatty acid binding protein one. And you can see in the figure the dynamics of expression. A similar pattern was found for the interleukin tumor uh, necrosis factor alpha, for interleukin 8, also for interleukin 15, the cell marker uh, chemokine mm -hmm. receptor type 3, the macrophage colony stimulating factor 1 receptor 1, and microbial pattern associated the uh, Toll light receptor 2 and toll light receptor 5. For these last two, the values of the deficiency diet and control diet were both higher than the excess diet. This is the same what happens with the proliferating uh, cell nuclear antigen. And finally, the full collective with an increase of expression in the deficient diet also. The exceptions of this gene expression profile were cadherin 17 with an increase of expression in the excess diet, mucin 2 with a decrease, marked in green, of expression in the deficient diet in comparison to the control diet, and chemokine receptor type 11. Type 11, yes, again, with upregulation of expression in the excess diet in comparison to the control diet. 
it is important also to notice that a plateau, a flat line, a broken line regression was achieved with the control diet and the excess diet in the case of fatty acid uh, binding protein one. Here you can see the plateau, the, the flat line, also a plateau with mothin two, interleukin 15, also with the macrophage coloring stimulating factor one receptor one, and with fucolectin. This trend, this dynamic, was less clear, but also evident in the case of a tumor necrosis factor alpha, but in any case, the level of expression in fish fed the control diet was kind of an inflection point. The same for interleukin-8 and for the chemokine receptor type 3. By contrast, the expression of levels of interleukin-10 remain mostly unchanged in fish fed the deficient of control diet, being downregulated by the excess mix of uh, vitamin B. And a similar plateau with deficient and control diets was found for the expression of chemokine receptor type 11 with an upregulation with excess of vitamin B. So having into account that interleukin 10 is an anti-inflammatory marker and the chemokine receptor type 11 is pro-inflammatory, the decrease of one and the upregulation of the other can be seen as part of the counter-regulatory response to maintain the tonus of the immune system at this excess of vitamins B can have an anti-inflammatory action at the gut level. So, as a conclusion of this analysis, we can see that the plateau lines confirm that the requirements of the mix of vitamins of type B are met with the control diet. And also, as seen with the upregulation with deficiencies of the inflammatory genes, that these deficiencies must trigger inflammatory pathways in the intestine. That's it for the vitamin B mix. We continue with the results of the three diets supplemented with graded levels of vitamin D. Here are the results, but don't panic. As you know now, uh, the dynamics, and this time it will be easier to show. Even that this time there were 16 differential express genes between the three diets. Six of them were markers of epithelium integrity. This time, two related with nutrient transport, you can start to see the common players in comparison with the last analysis, like fatty acid binding protein one. Also two interleukins, three cell markers, one marker of immunoglobulin production and two pathogen associated uh, microbial patterns. The main result here was a general decrease expression level with the higher levels of vitamin D here in green. As an example, you can see just the dynamics of the proliferal cell nuclear antigen. Here, you can see the, the decrease of expression with a higher level of vitamin D. And a plateau was observed in several in inflammatory markers, such as with the ratio of inflammatory tumor necrosis factor alpha with the anti-inflammatory interleukin 10, or others that you can see as an example with galactin 8. And finally, for vitamin K3, nine differential express genes with three markers of epithelial integrity, one marker, the fatty acid binding protein 6 related to nutrient transport, one mucin, mucin 13, and four different markers related to inflammatory response. The changes observed show the upregulation of the transcription factor H1B, a marker of the differentiation of goblet cells, cells that produce mucus, with a diet with an excess of vitamin K3, despite that there was a reduced expression of mucin 13. And this pattern was the same for the other two markers of epithelium integrity with upregulation with excess diets. The excess of vitamin K3 
also led to a market up regulation of the market of the entire site and biliary transport system, the fatty acid binding protein 6. And at the same time, pro-inflammatory markers were up or down regulated the pro-inflammatory markers at different degrees. However, regardless of this type of uh, response, the plateau, the flat line this time was observed with the low and intermediate supply of vitamin K3, suggesting that intestine function can be compromised by an excess rather than by a deficiency of this vitamin. So, in conclusion of this analysis, we can say that the targeted transcriptomic approach combining specific markers of intestinal functions can serve as a useful tool for testing the requirements of vitamins as well as that of other nutrients that could be tested. Another point is that the plateau of markers contribute to define the requirements of the different vitamins. And it has been seen that this plateau for the mix of vitamins B1, B9, B12 is achieved for markers of nutrient absorption and mucosal and inflammatory response. And that the plateau for vitamin D is mostly achieved for markers of inflammatory response. Another conclusion is that the lower levels of vitamin B and D activate inflammatory pathways. And that for vitamin K3, the excess has non-desirable effects on the integrity of the epithelium and with the production of mucus. In conclusion, the message to take home is that the target transcriptomic approach can be of utility using the same technique with a wide array of vitamins or other nutrients to be tested looking at the specific function in the intestinal tissue. And I think that, uh, yes, this is all. And thank you very much for your attention. OK, uh, so let me see if there is any answer, any questions, sorry? No questions? We have still five minutes for uh, answering questions regarding this presentation. If you want, Marta, if there are no questions for the moment, as they are uh, related uh, to vitamins and uh, David uh, just uh, has just explained also with vitamins, if there are some questions pending from him, uh, we, can, we can continue with them if you want. Yes, sure. I think uh, David uh, answered uh, already in the okay. to every question. Okay, I am going to check the box. Yes, okay, perfect. Okay, I, I might have one question if no one is asking. Yeah, there is a question, but you can also ask David. <laughs> uh, then, then ask then the reply to the question. Yes, I, I can ask later. Okay, uh, the question is what are the, the percentage of vitamins in a favorable diet? This question is <laughs> for. Okay, so it's easy to because uh, as we have explained, David and, uh, and me, uh, the percentage of every beta vitamin is different and must be tested for the specific vitamin and it's also different for the different species of fish that is culture the species of interest so uh, we have to start practically uh, from zero not 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 from zero because they, they, there is always uh, some uh, literature to to have a start but uh, you, you have to test there is not an exact rule. In, in fact, if, if it, there were a, a, a strict rule, we have been a, an hour here talking about nothing. <laughs> okay, uh, the answer was regarding the uh, CBAS. The same. Can I, can I add to that uh, reply, Josep? Yes, of course. Uh, actually, this is a very interesting question and Yusef has also made a very valid point and we, we must also take into consideration what criteria you're using to evaluate the requirement, not only in vitamins, in minerals, in amino acids, fatty acids, you always have different criteria to evaluate. Mm -hmm. You also have different species 
you also have different nutrients that you're going to be having the, depending on the ingredients that you're going to be using. So uh, it's very difficult to pinpoint a magic value. We could go for a more, uh, we wouldn't say more, not a practical approach, but like a more laboratory based approach like it was done back in the 70s in which you could use purified ingredients such as casein and with very little amounts of each of the micronutrients and test for what would be a basal requirement. But, uh, but then at the end of the day, you have so many different parameters being changed at the same time. When you change just one ingredient, you change your amino acids, you're changing fatty acids, and of course, minerals and vitamins. So, so this is always very tricky. And, and Yuseb and, uh, and Jaume have had very, very interesting results here. I think it was very interesting uh, to see the, the results from the B vitamins, because as you know, uh, some of these uh, B vitamins are also produced in the gut. So some of the bacteria or the archaea living there are already producing some of these B vitamins, also vitamin K. And I think it's very interesting to see that, you know, you're, you're managing to, to maybe alter the, I don't know if you think, do you think we're altering the population of this microflora when we include these different uh, nutrients with the, the different levels in the diets, you said? Okay, so yes, uh, we think, and indeed uh, working with microbiota is one other of the, of the areas that we are working, not, uh, not specifically in, the, in Perforfis, but in other but in other projects, and we can see that uh, every dietary intervention can have an effect on the microbiome in, and the gut microbiome and also with the, with the skin mucus uh, microbiome. Yes, mm -hmm. of course. And in fact, one of the, the goals now in, in, the, in the research that we're making is to find, trying to define an ideal microbiome and also uh, to look what can be the interventions to reach this ideal microbiome, uh, in fact, uh, to optimize uh, aquaculture production. Uh, yes, I think this, this should be the this should be the answer. But it, in the other part, I, one thing that of my presentation that I would like uh, to to point is that okay, uh, we are using a single tool for testing uh, for the different uh, vitamins, and maybe this tool can be used for the detailed intervention in other, in other uh, nutrients. Mm -hmm. But what it is important here is that we have uh, the transcriptome of, uh, of the Gilhead siblings, so we can construct a specific uh, array with uh, the genes that are of interest of us. Because it's, yes, I have shown you that uh, there are 44 different genes related to different processes. But uh, the most critical point for having success with this array is being able to select the proper uh, pathways and also the proper genes. Exactly. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and, and you know very well that this was almost uh, unknown up until a couple of years ago and it's until you guys managed to, to describe it very well. And I, it's very interesting because during all these years, you we've all, I was always had especially when you attend conferences in medicine, for instance, and people, they just tell you, why don't you just run an RNA seq and that's it? And why don't you just, and you know, it's back in the day, it wasn't so easy, right? It was, yes. it was a, yeah. The, the problem with the RNA seq, that's a problem. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very nice technique. It's, it's, it's a, I think, the same that when the micro rise started, that everybody wanted to spend money uh, having a micro array analysis, but they thought that, okay, I contract, I run a micro array, I press a button, and I have a result. Yeah. It's not so, so as easy as that, you know. Yeah. So at the end, the RNA sec and the micro arrays can serve to know, okay, I have thousands of genes, which are the important genes. You can run a sample test to, to know which are the most uh, important target, target genes. And we have 50, 60, maybe genes. So at, at this moment, you can uh, make a PCR array with these genes and you have with less time and less money uh, to have the results uh, like we have had with the, our PCR array. Yeah. 
absolutely.